Good. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Rodolf Borengo, so it's kind of like the reindeer with an O. Um, and I'm uh, here today uh, from NC State. Uh, I'm in the Department of, uh, of Food, uh, Bioprocessing and Nutrition at NC State University. And I run the CRISPR lab. So on a show of hand, who's heard about CRISPR before? And what did you hear about CRISPR? The CRISPR babies last week? What else? What is CRISPR? Gene editing, right? It's one of those technologies that is already poised to revolutionize the world. And the news last week that allegedly out of China, some scientists have been able to edit human embryos to alter the genetic content of the next generation of humans would have sounded like science fiction just a couple of years ago, but is now likely a reality. So what I'm going to do today is introduce you to CRISPR, tell you what it is, where it comes from, what it does from a scientific standpoint, but perhaps equally importantly, showcase to you and illustrate to you how it's going to impact the world for the rest of our lives, whether you're students, whether you're scientists, whether you're consumers, whether you're patients, whether you're parents, or whether you're professionals. So that's my plan and my uh, ambitious objective for the day today. Okay, so first of all, we live in what I'm going to call a CRISPR world. There's a lot of some data on here, some quantitative data that illustrate the speed, the rate, and the uh, breadth with which CRISPR has already been democratized across the globe. So if you look at the top left, if anybody ever heard of Adgene? Adgene is a repository, not-for-profit organization located in Boston, Massachusetts, actually Cambridge, uh, that is responsible for the dissemination at cost of CRISPR tools, amongst other things. And what they do is, for 65 bucks, they ship CRISPR-based tools and technologies and samples and plasmids to not-for-profit organizations they ask for. Think like White Tech or NC State or academic institutions, as well as not for profit organizations across the globe. And as of this year, they've already shipped over 100,000 samples to 100,000 different labs across the globe. So, for those of you who've been in a lab before, you can imagine that's between five and ten scientists in any one given institution. This means that there's between a half a million and one million scientists today in the world that use CRISPR-based technologies to change the genomes of the organisms they work on. And they're using thousands of plasmids deposited from hundreds of labs to carry out work. And the pace and rate at which that work is occurring is likely unprecedented in science, at least in biological sciences. And to give you the best measure of scientific work on the right right here you see those are the numbers from last year I'm updating them right now actually next month as of summer 2018 10,000 scientific studies investigating or using CRISPR based technologies have been published so this means that we have about half a million to a million scientists using thousands of those tools have published 10,000 scientific studies encompassing labs now from over 100 countries. All continents, most countries, have already received, at cost, CRISPR-based technologies from Adgene. This is illustrating the speed, the rate, and the geographic impact that CRISPR technology has had on a global basis. So this is why it matters we live in a CRISPR world. So what is CRISPR? Anybody want to take a shot at it? CRISPR is an acronym that stands for Clustered, Regularly Interspaced, Short, Palindromic Repeats. For those of you taking notes, go through that one more time, right? Clustered, Regularly Interspaced, Short, Palindromic Repeats. So. Most of you have taken probably a genetics class at some point in your life. And this is actually what a CRISPR looks like. Anybody sees anything? It's one of those things. Either you see it or you don't. If you don't see it, I'm going to give you a little bit of help. You should see some uppercasing. 
And since I'm an NC State guy, I get shown right here. And this is an example of an actual CRISPR, right? So clustered, you can see they co-occur together at one locus in the genome. Regularly interspaced here with exquisite periodicity from a genetic standpoint. Short, because the highlighted red sequence is about 31 to 36 nucleotides, depending on the system that you have. P for palindromic, because those geneticists amongst you see that the G, T, 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 T at one end of the sequence is the reverse complement of the A, 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 C at the three prime end. And R for repeat, because the same word is here, back to 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 back. This is the first time, clearly, you guys see a CRISPR. Sadly, it may be the last time in your lives you guys see a CRISPR. But you would have seen a CRISPR one time. Next time somebody talks about CRISPR, you can explain to them what that is. Okay? That's what CRISPR is. So the question is, what does it do? Now that we know what it is and what the acronym stands for, what does it do? So on a show of hand here, who's been vaccinated before? Hopefully all of you. And then people who don't get vaccinated probably are not going to make it through the next infectious disease wave. And the way immunization and vaccination works in human is through innate and also adaptive immunity. So you may have heard about the three dimensional stereophysical interaction, protein-protein based interaction between antibodies and antigenes. Does that ring a bell for anyone? Okay. So antibodies and antigenes enable humans and mammals, most vertebrates actually, to build through a lock and key type stereophysical interaction, adaptive immunity against non-self. Infectious disease like a bacterium or a virus. This is actually where the doctor will infect you with a deactivated version of a virus into the vaccine. Let's say the flu vaccine, which some of you may already have had or we shortly have, hopefully. So this concept of lock and key mechanism, protein-protein based interaction, is essentially what CRISPR does. But it's not in humans, it's in bacteria. Okay, the same concept. But rather than be protein-protein driven, it's DNA-DNA driven. That's the magic of CRISPR. So CRISPR is the adaptive immunity in bacteria that works by DNA recognition and DNA interference. And the only three things you need to know about CRISPR is that it's DNA encoded, RNA mediated, and DNA targeting. And the easiest way for me to explain to you what CRISPR is, mostly how it works, is to use one of these. What is this? It's a phone, right? What's your favorite feature on your phone? FaceTiming, the camera, right? So people actually use the phone not just to speak, but to actually take pictures or videos in this particular case, right? So CRISPR in many ways is the genetic equivalent of a camera. And it's a genetic camera that's going to capture a picture of an invasive nucleic acid. The CRISPR locus is going to use its genetic idiosyncrasy to capture a piece of DNA from a virus. And what it's going to do is it's going to integrate it right here in between two repeats. So that's seemingly random sequence that is in between any two CRISPR repeats is a piece of DNA that the CRISPR captured from an invasive genetic element like a virus or a plasmid. What CRISPR is, is a genetic vaccination card. So this is what I will show CRISPRs as today. All the repeats are the same. The black, green, Duke blue, and so on and so forth. This is a genetic record of your vaccination event. And the way it works is an easy three steps, DNA encoded, RNA-mediated, DNA targeting. The red phage comes in. The CRISPR gets turned on. And it will grab a genetic piece of the virus and integrate it as what's called a spacer in between two repeats. And by the way, this process is iterative over time. You go from right to left, from old to new, from ancient vaccination to most recent vaccination. 
This is a genetic record of all the bad decisions that this bacterium has made over time. Okay? Then the central domain biology applies. Anybody heard of the fir first central domain biology? Right, DNA to RNA. So DNA gets transcribed into CRISPR RNA. And this CRISPR RNA gets processed into a collection of like viral selfies, so to speak, whereby each guide RNA contains the sequence derived from one vaccination event. Okay? And then I'm going to turn this phone into a search device, like a control F, for those of you familiar with the word. And it's going to search for a sequence that is complementary to this CRISPR RNA. Control F. And if it finds it, if it finds a match, what it's going to do is cut it. And it's going to cut this sequence very precisely. Exactly three base pairs away, three nucleotides away from the end of the word. Control F. If I find a match, I will cut it. Okay? So genetic piece of iPhone in some ways. Combine that with Word document, control, find, and cut. Does that make sense? This is all you need to know about CRISPR. DNA encoded, RNA mediated, DNA targeting. Now, in nature, there's all kinds of CRISPR-Cas systems. So think uh, uh, cleavage devices in a kitchen. You may have a blender, you may have a knife, you may have a butcher knife, you may have a butter knife, you may have a sushi knife, you may have all kinds of cleavage devices. So CRISPR-Cas machineries in nature take different forms. And the kind of cuts that they generate are hypervariable. So in some cases you have here what I'm going to call a Pac-Man, an exonuclease. Cas3 is a rare 3 prime to 5 prime metal dependent, ATP dependent eight exonucleases which chews up chunks of DNA exonucleically. Others like Cas10 are more like a shredder. It shreds RNA. So it's going to cut like a chopping board the different RNA pieces. The key piece of CRISPR Cas machinery I'm going to talk about today is called Cas9. Anybody ever heard of Cas9? CRISPR associated sequence nuclease number 9. Cas9 is more of a molecular scalpel, a pair of scissors, if you will, that will very precisely generate a blunt double-stranded DNA cut. Not a sticky end, Cas12 does that, but a blunt double-stranded DNA break and cut. Okay, so I'll talk about Cas9, but there's different flavors of, of Cas system. Now, interestingly enough, very quickly, CRISPR is not new. CRISPR is actually a couple of decades old. CRISPR was first observed back in the 1980s, 1987. It took 15 years to get baptized into this CRISPR acronym. It took five years after that to show the actual function of CRISPR-Cas as immune systems in bacteria that provide adaptive immunity against viruses. But the world changed five years ago. Because five years ago, people were able to repurpose the CRISPR-Cas machinery, which in nature is a cleavage device for bacteria to cut viruses, and turn this scientific phenomenon into what I'm going to call CRISPR tech, a CRISPR tool, a CRISPR technology. It goes from an adaptive immune system that controls, finds, and cuts viral DNA to a programmable cleavage device pair of scissors, or a molecular scalpel. And this is used for genome editing. So I'm, I'm going to assume for a minute that all of you at some point in your life have, uh, have used a razor blade to shave a part of your body I don't need to hear about this morning. And I'm going to equate for a minute Cas9 to a molecular scalpel, a razor blade that cuts DNA, right? So imagine you have this molecular scalpel yourself, the razor blade, and you cut yourself, much like here I would cut two strands of DNA. What happens when you cut yourself? You bleed, and then what happens? You heal. What's the process of a uh, blood healing called? Coagulation, clotting, okay? And essentially, when you clot, you're going to repair the cut 
and you're going to have a little mark, depending on how heavily handed you were when you cut yourself, you have a scar. So the same concept happens to DNA when you cut DNA. When I cut DNA, I'm going to cut those double-stranded breaks into those two strands of DNA, the double helix. And then endogenous DNA repair pathway is going to come in and patch those back together. There's two major ways to do this. One is called non-homologous and joining. I'm going to take those two non-homologous ands, and H E J, and I'm going to patch them back together, just like you would rub some dirt on your cut, put some duct tape on it, or maybe sew yourself back up together if you were like doing this at home or go to the vet, let's say. Okay? And what you're going to have when you do that is a scar, a visible scar. So genetically, you'll get a scar called a single nucleotide variant or single nucleotide polymorphism, SNV or SNP. Or you get a small indel, a small insertion or a small deletion. You're going to patch this by adding a couple of bases or removing and cutting the bases or changing the one base at the side of cleavage. That's the quick and dirty way to do DNA repair. Now let's assume for a minute that when you cut yourself, you're too vain to uh, patch yourself up or to, uh, say, go to the vet and put some dirt on it. What do you do? Let's say you, have, you don't want a scar on your pretty face or your attractive thigh. What do you do? Where do you go? Go to the surgeon. Not the vet. Not your friend at home who's going to sew it back together. You're going to go to a molecular surgeon. They're like go to Duke University or something, right? Duke Hospital. And what they're going to do is they're going to use a template, your other cheek, your other thigh, right, to repair very precisely, very surgically the cut that you just did. Or if you're very vain, you may give a template to the doctor of somebody else's face, somebody else's fat distribution, somebody else's thigh to repair accordingly, right, cosmetic surgery. So in the DNA world, this process is called homology-directed repair, HDR, whereby you're going to provision a template to the repair molecular machinery to replace and repair and patch together the sequence that was cleaved with what you provision. And you can get an insertion, you can get a deletion, or you can get a very precise intended mutation. And that's why it's called genome editing, because this process rewrites the sequence of the DNA precisely at the site of cleavage. You edit DNA. You change the sequence of DNA. And you can do that in human cells. So this stuff is so last year, right? Like in the scientific world of CRISPR, this proof of concept was first provided five years ago by Feng Zhang at MIT and the Broad Institute of Harvard. So now the average PhD geneticist can delete, insert, or knock out any sequence you can think of in pretty much virtually any organism you can think of. And ever since, in the past five years, those half million to a million scientists have been hard at work to advance, diversify, and enhance what I'm going to call the CRISPR toolbox. And now we have versions of, let's say, Cas9 or Cas12 that are deactivated. You take your, your scissors and you ablate their ability. You inactivate, you deactivate their ability to actually cut DNA. And you turn them into a DNA binding device. And what you can do is you can tether transcriptional activators to deactivated versions of Cas9 to turn transcription up. You turn the sound up of transcription. Or you can tether DCAS9 to repressors, transcriptional inactivators, to turn the volume down of transcription. Or you can tether DCAS9 to deaminases and do base editing. You can tether DCAS9 to fluorophores to do imaging. You can do that in sixplex called CRISPR rainbow six different colors, or you can tether DCAS9 to acetyltransferases or methyltransferases to alter the epigenetic state of DNA. Actually, my friend Charlie Gersbach was the first to show this at Duke a couple years ago. This means now that genome editing, 
much like an editor will rewrite your work, or your report, or your paper, has the ability to alter the text and the punctuation. The genome, the epigenome, and the transcriptome. With the CRISPR toolbox, scientists now have the ability to alter DNA at will. And the power that we have and the tool that we have and the technology that lies before us in those 100 countries and 100,000 labs is the ability to change any DNA you want, any way you want, in any organism you can think of. So in the last five years, since the inception of CRISPR tech for genome editing, this half million cohort of scientists has used and implemented CRISPR across the board. Model organisms at the bottom of the value pyramid. That's what academics do. They work on viruses, bacteria, yeast, model organisms, all the way to the non-humanoid non chimps. Likewise, scientists in the industry can work on organisms relevant to food and ag. Think of a, a CRISPR chicken. Not crisp, crisper. Same with the bacon, crisper bacon. Not crisp, crisper. And at the top of the pyramid, medical applications. People working on humanizing pigs to make them human organ donors. People working on antivirals, gene therapies, and more. I'm going to give you one example because I think it's visually very compelling, right? This is a butterfly. And the colored wing pattern of a butterfly is the butterfly equivalent <coughs> of the human retina. The unique aspect that we have globally of the human iris pattern. Not two humans have the same human retina much like not any two butterflies can share the same wing pattern. So with CRISPR, you can take cells from this butterfly, take some cells out, deliver CRISPR to it, and ask the CRISPR gas machinery to target a gene called yellow. What do you think the yellow gene does? It encodes the color yellow in the wings of butterflies. And you can grow a smaller butterfly, which will have and showcase the identical wing pattern, except without the color yellow. And it works with other colors. You can put colors in, colors out, darkness in, darkness out, lightness in, lightness out, colors in, or swap colors. Butterflies are not particularly notorious for being genetically tractable and easy to manipulate. So the point here is that if you can do this in butterflies, I would argue the only limit to what you can do with CRISPR-based tools is your own imagination, for good or for bad. Technologically, we now have the ability to alter any genome we want, any way we want, in any organism we can think of. So this is a, a five-year-old technology. You guys have seen a five-year-old before? It's about this tall, right? For those of you old enough, maybe you remember the first, uh, the first cell phone five years in did not look like this. The first car five years in did not look anything like the car we have to do. The first plane five years in, you would not want to get on. So we're talking about a very young technology five years old. But this five-year-old is the best and at the same time scariest technology we've seen in probably a couple of decades in biology and genetics. Why? Well, because programmable, specific, transferable, efficient, precise, affordable, quick, multiplexable, and scalable. It has all those great perquisites. And though we can do everything I just told you, it's only five years old. We're still improving technology at this early stage of development. We still need to make it better. So much like a five-year-old still 
It's a little fat. It's got a little chunk on it. To deliver Cas9 to, through retroviruses to human cells is kind of packed to the gills. It's a little busy. It's a little large. It's a large protein. It's a big, actually, molecular pair of scissors. Throws a tantrum here and there, like a five-year-old. It's not always reliable, and it's not always 100% predictable. But we're training it. We're developing it. We're harnessing it. We're coercing it. Okay? So it can take a little bit of time to get perfect. It's not quite perfect yet. And there's things we need to improve. And the, the two biggest challenges that a lot of people are working on are really controlling the repair. So cutting used to be almost impossible or very difficult or expensive and time-consuming to cut DNA to do genome editing. Now cutting is trivial. Controlling the repair and the balance of a quick and dirty patch with a scar versus a very precise mutation, that's still somewhat challenging. To predict the outcome and control and coerce and redirect various DNA repair pathways. And at the same time, it's very hard to deliver CRISPR to large amounts of cells. So imagine like a human that has a genetic disease, right? We could take a human cell, bombard it with a bunch of CRISPR, and cure the disease out of it. Almost like that. It's almost trivial to do it with one human cell. But to do it with a whole patient, you cannot like just take a patient, dunk them into a pool of CRISPR, come back a week later and see how they're doing. We're not there yet. The delivery of CRISPR systemically to all cells in the human body is still very difficult. Okay? So we'll get back to that. But soon enough, we'll be in a world whereby any of you can say, I want a piece of CRISPR that will cut my DNA here, and I want it tomorrow, and it will cost you less than 100 bucks. This, five years ago, would have sounded like science fiction. Today, it's reality. And we're also on the cusp of a CRISPR toolbox that will be multiplexable. So think of a tool like a screwdriver, flat heads versus Phillips screws. You have to use preferably the right tool if you don't want to get hurt with the right screw. It's called orthogonality. What we're working on right now is orthogonal CRISPR-Cas systems, orthogonal tools, so you can concurrently turn transcription up in some cases, down in other cases, do elimination, do base editing, do epigenetics, and then edit the genome. We need six tools to do that at the same time. We're on the cusp of having those tools readily available. So how far have we gone in the last five years? Well, as of today already, whether you're a consumer or a patient or a scientist or a parent or a caregiver or a caretaker, CRISPR has or will revolutionize your life. On a show of hand, who thinks they've eaten a, a CRISPR product yet? One, one and a half, maybe two. Let me ask the question again in 10 minutes. So from left to right, this is the value chain. I actually went to business school, amongst other things. And I'm mesmerized and impressed and almost in disbelief at the ability of the one technology to impact so many different fields at the same time, concurrently. If you're in the biotech business, tools, kits, guides, enzymes, primers, plasmids, cell lines, and softwares for CRISPR is rampant all over. It's a market that's growing double to triple digits every year. Very good investment. I'm not here to dispense investment advice, but uh, compelling investment for those companies investing in that technology. If you move from this to the industrial biotechnology business, anything that's using bacteria, yeast, or algae to make food by manufacturing enzymes, household cares, or bioenergy, lagging a little bit behind, nonetheless, on the, on the map, all those organisms have been, are being, or on the, on the list to shortly be genome edited to enhance their yield, their survivability, and their functionalities. Better enzymes, better detergents, better insulin, better biofuel, better algae, better fungi, better bacteria, and so on and so forth. Actually, there's dozens of companies in RTP using those technologies today to make the next generation products. If you move up the value chain and we talk about food, I'm a food scientist. I work in a college of ag and life sciences at NC State. And I spent 10 years in the industry at DuPont. I was a former R&D director in one of the divisions at DuPont to use technologies like CRISPR 
with the food supply chain. But there's a good thing those carries for you guys to decide. But plants, animals, and bacteria used in the food supply chain have been, are being, or will be genome edited using CRISPR. Right now I'm working on a, on a company to do a, a CRISPR trees for Christmas, right? Imagine like a glow-in-the-dark tree, no decorations needed. Small market of scientific geeks, but very cool nonetheless. But you can alter the phenotypes of CRISPR to fix more CO2, to grow in more drought conditions, or even over-moist conditions. Reforestation, not deforestation. You can do CRISPR in flowers and plants and bushes and aquaculture. It's happening. And last but not least, and arguably the most financially compelling, in my opinion, and that of many others, is the use of CRISPR for therapeutics. In the next year, if I were to give this talk next year, right here, I would be talking about progress in the clinic from several clinical trials underway that are recruiting right now. We'll have the results six months from now. For multiple companies, I'll just go into in a minute. So gene therapies, we're going to cure genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis, beta thalassemia, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We can correct a faulty gene in an adult. It's crazy, but it's happening. We can do the same for antivirals. Right now, you can take a bunch of human cells, expose them to HIV, infect them successfully, deliver a CRISPR that will recognize the two ends of inserted HIV-1 and cut HIV-1 out of a human cell. Almost trivially like this. We can cure HIV out of a human cell. We're not yet at curing HIV 100% of the time in 100% of a patient's cells. But if we can figure out delivery, we're going to solve that. You've heard of immunotherapies, right? Coercing the human immune system into fighting off carcinogenic centers. There's thousands of people working on using CRISPR to kill cancer cells selectively and specifically, and it's happening. To re-engineer, redesign your immune system for immunotherapies. Organ donors, organ transplants, shortage of tissues, lung, liver, kidneys, hearts, and more. There's a company called Eugenesis working on using CRISPR to humanize pigs so we could grow your own customized DNA encoded cells into an animal and do a self graft. That sounds like science fiction. It's happening. Whether it's scary or good, desirable or not, we'll discuss that in a few minutes. I'm here to make you think, not agree with me. I may not even believe half the things I say. Right? Think about that. Microbiomes, antimicrobials, gene drives, diagnostics, and pet care. There's almost a limitless, this is a non-exhaustive list of what I know are the various avenues of CRISPR translational medicine. If you're more curious and, and uh, you have access to a computer or an iPhone or any other phone you like, Chrome or whatever it is, right? Samsung, I'm not here to advise any particular brand. You can go online and check the three publicly traded CRISPR-based companies that are working on CRISPR therapeutics. First one on the left is Intelia. The one in the middle is CRISPR therapeutics and the one on the right is Editas Medicine. And there's public lists of what they're working on. Things like sickle cell disease with Novartis, right? Things like diabetes, hemophilia. Things like cystic fibrosis. Those are publicly available, publicly traded company information that every quarter update the whole world on where they are with their clinical trials 
and clinical pipeline in progress. If you're curious, they're very easy to find. Likewise, this is happening in the ag world. It's more like my world. We're using CRISPR for CRISPR crops, corn, wheat, soy, the big three, rice, fruits and vegetables, tomatoes, tomatoes, right? Mushrooms, these are the, the browning mushrooms. One of the biggest challenge in the white button mushroom market is the browning of that white mushroom into a brown mushroom. When you go to the store, you guys know like it looks too brown. It looks like it's boiled. Oftentimes it's not, it's just oxidized a little bit. You can use CRISPR to target the oxidation gene in white button mushroom and prevent browning. That's so last year, Penn State. We're working on CRISPR in non-food crops, like tobacco, like hemp, CRISPR with a K, trees, cellulose, bioenergy. We can use CRISPR. Uh, I have two experiments. I didn't bring any samples here. But you can use CRISPR in trees to change the color of the branches, more or less red, more or less brown, more or less yellow. If you want your furniture a certain color, imagine like ordering your tree custom grown for the color that you want. We can likewise impact the grain. You want it more grainy or more sandy. Imagine growing the tree that you want. You're not even eating it. Just making furniture out of it or houses out of it or paper out of it. We can change paper yield and cellulose extraction for the paper industry with CRISPR trees. And then last but not least is bacteria. So actually it happens to be what I spend the bulk of my time on for strategic reasons and cost reasons and convenience reasons and personal preference and scientific knowledge reasons. And what's interesting is that CRISPR comes from bacteria. So if you want to look at the future of CRISPR, all you've got to do is look at what's happening today in bacteria. And I've spent already almost 15 years of uh, my own career working on CRISPR in bacteria and other things. And we've been doing all those things using the vaccination card to tell who they are, where they come from, all the bad decisions that they've made. Phage defense, antivirals, plasmid defense, genome editing, nutritional control, genome remodeling, and selective killing. But if you want to kill cancer cells, we can kill bacterial cells. So let me give you some very specific examples quickly. So each line here is one bacterium. One bacterium, two bacteria. And each block square is a unique vaccination event in this bacterium. One bad decision the bacterium made at some point in its life. Time goes from right to left. Those are the old vaccination events. Those are the new vaccination events. Those are CD5 isolates from hospitals and patients. And what we know is all those isolates have the same common ancestry. Epidemiologically, they have a common ancestor. And at the third vaccination event, there was a dichotomy, the pink ones and the gray ones and so on and so forth. You can see the top three isolates right here that made the same people sick come from the same bacterium. Whereas uh, this guy from uh, Virginia Tech, the Virginia Polytechnic Institute, made a lot of bad decisions, been around the block a few times, and he's unique. This is a different bacterium making different people sick. What we can do is we can superimpose this genetic data from the different C. diff with metadata where did people go? What flies did they take? What food did they eat? What hospitals were they in? What friends did they hang out with? What connections did they make? Whom did they cross-contaminate? And you can rebuild the disease in space and time. Imagine doing that for the Department of Defense on biological warfare. Those technologies have been used to track bacteria across the globe. With CDC and FDA and various departments of agriculture across the globe to look at food pathogens like salmonella. Imagine being able to tell whether different chipotle have the same romaine lettuce problem or not. Whether the same people who ate the same food at the same barbecue were contaminated by the same food source or not. Or whether the same patients at the same hospital down the street were contaminated by the same 
fecal matter or food matter or biowarfare matter or not. This is maybe my favorite application of all time because I was involved heavily. This is a yogurt manufacturing, dairy manufacturing, and cheese manufacturing. The transformation of lactose into lactic acid by starter cultures that acidify milk. This culture at the top, DuPont Global Culture Collection 7710, I spent a couple of my years working on that guy in particular, makes the best yogurt in the world. Stick my word for it. But unfortunately, this particular bug gets hammered by ubiquitously present bacteriophage that are viruses of bacteria that occur across the globe in milk. They only make bacteria sick, not us. Milk is not sterile. So what you can do with CRISPR is you can take this bacterium, expose it to a phage, let nature run its course, and isolate a variant that picked up a piece of DNA from that virus and take that guy, expose it to a second phage, and select a natural variant that vaccinated itself against the virus. And take that guy against the third virus, and isolate a variant that has one, two, and three vaccination events, and do that again with the fourth virus, and within about two weeks, you get plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four vaccination events. And you get a starter culture that makes the best yogurt in the world, that is now super immune to a bunch of viruses that kill it in the field. And it's a natural process because it's a natural vaccination event. I spent nine years at DuPont. And since 2011, you guys remember 2011? 2011, a long time ago, 100% of all the starter cultures sold commercially by DuPont across the globe have been CRISPR enhanced. What does that mean? It means that if you've had one bite of cheese, one bite of yogurt, one, one nacho, one bite of pizza, or one cheeseburger, anywhere in the world since 2011, there's a pretty much 100% chance you've consumed a dairy product that was manufactured using a CRISPR enhanced bacteria, one of the products I developed. So let me ask the question again, who thinks they've eaten CRISPR food before? That's what I thought. I'll let you think about that. This process of iterative vaccination, by the way, creates a unique genetic record in the DNA of those bacteria. Let's say yellow, blue, pink, red, green. Yellow, blue, pink, red, and green. This genetic tag, yellow, blue, pink, red, green, is now a unique genetic tag that is in your yogurt culture. If I find that tag in your culture and you didn't buy that tag from me, you're in trouble. And I'm going to bet you'll be unable to explain how you got that tag into your product without buying it from me. Culture companies have been using that technology that I patented a long time ago to track all the bacteria that make all the food across the globe to see who's buying what from whom. I'll let you think about that. We could use this in human microbiomes, human fecal matter, and tell whose crap comes from where. We can use that in oral microbiome. We can use that in vaginal microbiomes and understand what bacteria grow into a baby that was vaginally delivered versus C-section delivered. Let you think about that. Okay? We can actually use CRISPR, so let me go back just for one minute to that um, Pac-Man I talked about earlier in my talk. The Pac-Man is like the chainsaw of all razor blades. If you cut yourself with a chainsaw, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to patch it back together, rub some dirt on it, sew it back together, does your arm falls off? Probably not. So what uh, the CRISPR-Cas3 system affords is the ability to obliterate certain genomes, certain bacteria. And what we can do is we can use the programmability of CRISPR to selectively and precisely 
and programmably target certain bacteria only in a microbiome. If we can target E. coli and kill 99.999% of all E. coli in one sample with one shot of CRISPR, and we can multiplex that. Think about that. So not only is it efficient, but it's programmable. So you can take E. coli versus salmonella and kill just E. coli or just salmonella, or both. Or you can take two that are 99.9% .9 identical and kill one by just selectively targeting this unique, peculiar genetic idiosyncrasy in one organism, or both. We now have programmable antibiotics. This is a company, actually, Locus Bio, in RTP, uh, that's doing very well right now. And then last but not least, you can use CRISPR to screen for larger events. You can use CRISPR to look for what's called expandable genetic islands and pieces of DNA that can go off on their own. The advantage with that is that it'd be non-GMO. Oops. So the bottom line is all those tools have been used, are being used, will continue to be used across the food supply chain to make your food for tomorrow, whether it's dairy cultures, whether it's editing, whether it's chickens, whether it's antimicrobials, whether it's probiotics, whether it's tagging and tracking samples of people, or whether it's industrial workhorses that make your food. It's happened, and it's happening. As a matter of fact, just at NC State down the street, my lab is involved in all those projects, working across the food supply chain. We work with corn companies to edit corn for yield, for waxy corn, carbohydrate content, more or less sugar, more or less complex sugars. We're making CRISPR chickens. I kid you not. We have transgenic chickens and pigs at NC State at the College of Veterinary Medicine. We've edited pathogens, starter cultures, and human probiotics. You can give me, this is a no joke, I'm serious, an average redneck from North Carolina. He can spend six or seven years in my lab and come out a CRISPR wizard. We've done it before, I'm doing it today, and I'll do it again. That's my job as a state employee running the CRISPR lab at NC State to advance the CRISPR technology for the well-being of the state, the nation, and the world. It's happening every day. My last seven graduates, uh, masters and PhDs, have all gone to industry and all have fantastic jobs implementing CRISPR in food and ag and biotech every day. This is why this is a legitimate, tangible, scientific craze. CRISPR makes the cover of one of those magazines every week. It's the best technology we've ever had. Again, look at the numbers. 100,000 labs, maybe 1 million people, 10,000 plasmids, 500 labs developing it, 10,000 studies over 100 countries. It's happening, people. But outside of the CRISPR world, CRISPR has made it to the media. All of you heard about CRISPR probably not by reading a scientific journal. You heard about CRISPR in the news, because last week it was all over. Time Magazine, CNN, if it wasn't even on TV. Right? CRISPR is in Luke Cage and the X-Files. So last year. CRISPR made the cover of Time Magazine talking about CRISPR babies two years ago. July 4th issue, the most read Time Magazine issue of the year. This is no accident. It's crazy. But the real revolution is not in the media. The real revolution is not happening in science. I would argue the real revolution is happening in the real world, the business world. This slide is from five years ago. Five years ago, all those companies with no CRISPR knowledge, no CRISPR tech, no CRISPR IP, no CRISPR experts decided to invest millions and eventually billions of dollars into that technology across the globe in food and ag, in agriculture, and in biotech. As a matter of fact, you can look right here, the the NASDAQ tickers, Bayer, Vertex, Novartis, J&J, 
Allergen, Celgene, GSK, Amgen, Baxter, AstraZeneca, and on and on and on and on, all have made public announcements with regards to CRISPR IP licensing and or CRISPR investments and partnerships. As a matter of fact, this is the my or the list of CRISPR-based startup companies only. At the very top, first generation, Caribou Bio, Entire Therapeutics, CRISPR Therapeutics, ERS Genomics, and Editas Medicine, three of which have gone public at the NASDAQ. I got to ring the bell at the NASDAQ. That's crazy. That's crazy. On the right, second generation, therapeutics only company, Beam, Mammoth, Casibia, and eGenesis. eGenesis is the company that's doing the, the humanized animals for organ donation. At the bottom, antibiotic companies, Sniper, Eligo, Nexbiotics, and Locus. Even our own, NC owned, NC started, Locus Biosciences. Last year, fundraises a $21.5 million Series A, maybe the biggest Series A ever for a biotech company in North Carolina. Bottom left, CRISPR Tools, LifeEdit, Arbor, and Cazine. Life Vetted, by the way, a startup company that just spun out at a vac biome in RTP. And last but not least on the left, in Ariag and Pairwise Plants. Pairwise Plants, a 120 million Series A company that just relocated from California and Boston into RTP across the street from Syngenta. It's crazy, and it's happening. But all those great technologies come great responsibilities. As a distinguished professor at NC State, science is only one part of the job. Ethical implications. I got invited this year to go to uh, Oxford to participate in their debate society to discuss whether or not genome editing is against the nature of humanity. Is it or is it not? We can talk about that if you're curious. Whom should decide whether we regulate CRISPR or not? Whether we disseminate CRISPR or not? Whether we use CRISPR or not? Should the scientists decide? Should the ethicists decide? Should the politicians decide? Should the consumers decide? Who should tell the patients whether they should or not use CRISPR? Whether they can or not have access to CRISPR? Same for PR. GMOs, Franken Foods, crazy scientists reinventing the world, Jurassic Park and Gattaca all over again, except now it's real. Is this crazy? Or corporations trying to kill the world or make it better? How are we going to regulate this? Earlier this week, I was in D.C. giving a lecture on CRISPR to regulators. What is it? How does it work? How are we going to regulate this thing? Is it FDA? Is it USDA? Is it APHIS? Department of Defense? Government? Earlier this year, the Pope invited 300 CRISPR scientists at the Vatican to talk about CRISPR. The Pope is visionary and knowledgeable enough about CRISPR six months ago to say, we need to get this thing together. What are we going to do about this? What's my opinion? Bottom line, quote unquote, we have a duty to care and a duty to cure for humankind. If CRISPR-based technologies can help us alleviate pain and suffering for humans, we have a duty to care and a duty to cure. Should we listen to the Pope or not listen to the Pope? I'll let you guys think about that. And this aside, this is one of the reasons why as an ag guy, as a food guy, as a cal scientist, I think CRISPR is well poised to be most impactful short term in agriculture. Because ethics in plants is not the same as ethics in human babies. There's a path to IP. It's easier to manipulate the embryos of plants than of humans. Cheaper to grow. Less regulated. We can use CRISPR in DNA free versions. We can grow a thousand plants, just pick the one we want. We can grow a thousand humans and pick just the one we want at least not in this country. 
I'll let you think about that. I had an epiphany two years ago. And I realized, just for the sake of time, I can't have the conversation. I realized that there's about six to eight million scientists in the world. People with graduate degrees in science that do research in science every day. It's what I call, like, quote, unquote, team science. So there's like eight million of us. How many of them? You guys know how many people in the world today? Give or take. Eight billion, right? So for every one of us, there's a thousand of them. Every single scientist over the course of their lifetime to convince people about the value of science would have to expose 1,000 people to what they do and why it matters. And my epiphany was, A, we suck at this, and B, we're not really equipped to do it, and we're not making a difference. Skepticism about science, global warming, vaccination, and on and on and on. So what we did is we uh, embarked on a two-year project to make a movie, a documentary about CRISPR. What is CRISPR? How does it work? What does it do? And how is it going to change the world? This was submitted last month to Sundance. They come out next year. I'm also the editor-in-chief of the CRISPR Journal, a brand new journal dedicated exclusively to CRISPR. I actually have to edit my editorial to be published on Monday to opine on behalf of the editorial board how we feel about people using CRISPR to edit human embryos. It's not trivial. It's very important. It's very serious. You only get one shot. One thing interesting about CRISPR, for those of you who really want to be scientists, who wants to be a scientist in the room when they grow up? At least some. It's very rare in such a short time span to take a scientific discovery of CRISPR as the immune system in bacteria 10 years ago, translate that into CRISPR genome editing technology, apply that technology in medicine and food and ag and biotech to make tangible real products, whether they're on your plate or in your veins. And what's clear right now is that the science, surprisingly, is the easy part. But the regulatory aspects, the ethical aspects, and engaging the public and society aspects are the hard part. That's crazy for a scientist to realize that's the barrier to entry. And this is why we all need to do our job, whether you want to be a scientist or not. We have to work with politicians. Government, industry, farmers, consumers, patients, doctors, ethicists, lawyers, and on and on and on to decide what the future of this technology is going to be. So with one minute to go, I'm going to stop the monologue. Right? I'm going to uh, disclose right here on the bottom left all my funding. Much of my funding actually comes from the state. As a state employee, I'm very pleased with that fact. NC State is extremely supportive of all my activities. The NC Biotech Center is likewise supportive. And the NCAC Foundation, extremely supportive of CRISPR work going on at NC State. I also receive much funding from industry. Spend nine years at DuPont. I still get money from them into the lab. We work with BSF, a local company in RTP. We work with Pioneer. And we work with Elysium. And then also have very tight collaborations with, I mentioned Charlie Gersbach at Duke and uh, Jennifer Duna, the great Jennifer Duna, and Jill Benfield at UC Berkeley. As a state employee, I must also disclose my uh, financial interests. So I'm actually quite pleased uh, to still be a shareholder of DuPont back from when I was a director. I'm not going to sell that stock until next year when they have their divestiture with Dow. Again, I'm not here to dispense any financial advice. I'm the former chairman of the board and an investor and shareholder in uh, Caribou Biosciences, the first ever CRISPR company out of Berkeley, California. Uh, I'm a co-founder and advisor and shareholder to Interior Therapeutics 
I'm a, a co-founder, former advisor, and shareholder and investor in Locust Biosciences. I'm an editor-in-chief of the CRISPR Journal, and I'm also a shareholder and advisor to an REAC. And I'll hereby disclose that those financial shareholdings are a product of my knowledge about CRISPR, not an influencer thereof whatsoever. So I thank you for your attention. And then maybe we have time for a few questions. If you're curious about CRISPR, check out uh, at CRISPR Lab, uh, Twitter, Instagram, website, at CRISPRJ. I have a Twitter in chief in my lab and all that stuff. So if you're curious, just get in touch with me and let us know. Thank you. Questions? Are we time bound? No. no. So I have at least 20 minutes <laughs> left before I have to go to give my one o'clock talk. So I'm yours. I'm time Please. Cultures, yep. Yeah, so it's pretty inefficient. It's about one in a million on average. So you kill most of them, but you can select for the ones that survive. Um, and then they don't pass it on because they don't conjugate. Yeah, so it's a very selfish vaccination event. Uh, but once they're vaccinated, though, it's very efficient. So the vaccination event is inefficient at the population level. The vaccinated bacteria are very resistant to the infected virus. So good, good technical question. Yeah. And that's how actually how the whole CRISPR story started of finding phage resistance and adaptive immunity using Cas9, by the way, in uh, bacteria used to make yogurt and cheese across the globe at DuPont. Please, Coco. So you talked about the issues in the tech world. You talked about questions of regulation. You talked about what the scope is. So to elaborate on the cons a little bit more, what are you doing for host species? Is this in the wrong way or is not in the Right. So, so, so the pros are pretty obvious, right? So, so the cons are acceptance by society fear of GMOs and not understanding breeding. That's a major con. Equating genetically engineered food to like frankenfood or transgenic food. There's ways to use CRISPR to just replicate and recapitulate uh, breeding patterns that occur naturally in nature that would just take forever to do or that would take a lot of money to find, right? So the cons really are people misusing that technology. So biohacking. So there was a biohacker earlier this year who self-engineered some CRISPR crap, self-injected that CRISPR crap, and died later because they're an idiot, scientifically. Now, whether that's natural selection or a tragedy depends on, or maybe both, depends on how you feel about this. Loss of life is tragic. Now, you know, what I show you with the butterfly or any other example I mentioned, right, it's relatively straightforward, not quite trivial, but straightforward for any average PhD geneticist to use CRISPR. So that means that someone who wants to biohack CRISPR for warfare purposes, you could weaponize a virus and make it more virulent. You can weaponize a food pathogen and make it more virulent or aggressive or invasive. There's legitimate concern from the Department of Defense about the use of CRISPR for biowarfare or bioterrorism. And it's kind of like the, the, the dark web, right? Are we going to forbid or like unplug the internet because there's a dark web? Probably not. Are we going to stop writing because some people write crap and ink is bad? Probably not. And are there easier ways to kill people than genetics of CRISPR? Absolutely. But it still doesn't mean that the cons don't need to be accounted for or don't need to be addressed. The biggest con in my mind today is ethical. Some guy last week in China, who's not an MD by the way, decided to edit the wrong gene the wrong way for the wrong disease in human embryos. No medical need, no justification whatsoever. Take those five day embryos that are edited, implant them into the womb of a, of a woman, and give birth to kids. 
with no clinical supervision, or not proper clinical supervision, I should say, with no disclosure, with no heads up, and with no animal trials. That's irresponsible. To me, that's a bigger problem. It's not the technology. Technology is neither good nor bad. It's the user. What do you do with it? Whether we talk about the internet, whether we talk about weapons, whether we talk about ink, whether we talk about CRISPR, right? The technology or TNT or the, the technology itself is neither good nor bad. It's the user that decides what to do with it. When we use that to cure disease in patients that are otherwise dying that have no alternative, we're saving their lives or extending the lifespan or the quality of life. That's really a duty that we have in terms of duty to care, to quote the Pope. But can we have other people say, hey, I'm going to take that right away from you. I'm not comfortable with you using CRISPR to edit your own genome. I mean, who has jurisdiction? Is it government? Is it individual? Is it society? Should we be overly cautious? Pump the brake and have a moratorium and time out on CRISPR until we can figure that out? Or can we not afford to wait because people die every day? There's people who are like asking and begging to be part of CRISPR trials because they have six months to live. And if we don't give them a cure in six months, they're not going to live anymore. They'll be gone. Can we tell them, you know what? We're going to think about it in six months, get back to you. Which one is irresponsible? So the challenge is that there's no clear answer that is broadly applicable to all fields, all cases, all opinions, all cases, all problems. It's not one, one size fits all solution to that problem. So CRISPR conundrum, if you will. But people are discussing it. People are aware of it. And there's literally thousands of uh, scientists and others across the globe, politicians, philosophers, ethicists, lawyers, regulators, investors, and inventors that are all literally, as we speak, sitting down and pondering how we're going to deal with this and what do we do now that the cat's out of the bag. So I'm um, one of many. Yeah, so they are very aware. As a matter of fact, a year and a half ago, CRISPR was on the list of uh, not to cross the border technologies uh, per the Department of Defense. It has been since been uh, removed and lifted. They're monitoring it, they're aware of it, they're educating themselves, and they're tracking uh, a lot of users using government-based methods I can go into and I'm not fully aware of, as a matter of fact, uh, across the globe, not just domestically, to keep track of what's happening. So those problems are not new, right? The use of ethics-based decisions and training for scientists is not CRISPR-dependent. Um, there's a lot of classes um, and there's a lot of courses that are already built into a scientific curriculum. So in the force of at NC State, back when I was a student a while back, it was already there. And one of the seven programs I'm affiliated with on campus at NC State is the Genome Engineering and Society Center. And we have multiple ethicists there, multiple ethical classes that educate uh, uh, students. Uh, what we're realizing, though, is that teaching a class doesn't mean the class is efficient. Because we're teaching it doesn't mean people get it. And sometimes people can get it and then decide to forego it. As a matter of fact, with the conundrum that I have to deal with actually today, later today, uh, and can make a decision before tomorrow, is the, the gentleman who edited those embryos in China, right? Irresponsibly, unjustifiably, perplexingly, inacceptably. I mean, you can, you can come with all despicable, uh, you know, all kind of uh, uh, adjectives you can think of that are relevant. Published a paper last week on the ethics of CRISPR. And he contravened his own opinion. Actually he happened to be the editor-in-chief of the journal in which he published that paper. So I find myself engaged in a conversation with the authors of the study, perplexed, and having to make the decision as to whether we're going to 
pull a paper. Not because the paper is bad, because the paper is fine. The paper went through peer review process. It was vetted. It was edited. It was published. There's issues about conflicts of interest not being disclosed, but that's, that's a technicality, so to speak. So we have an author that has an opinion there's not an authority on ethics. Never was, never will be, obviously. Contravene his own opinion. Is the opinion still valid when you disagree with your own self? It's a good conundrum. So I have to do grab with that. So and that person took an ethics class. Do we blame the individual or the teacher that didn't do their job? Or the institution that taught a class that's so inefficient? Who's to blame? Is it all of them? Some of them? One of them? At least the individual himself is to blame. And the guy claims he's doing it for the right reasons to save people's lives. There's just another way to do it. So he's just an idiot, scientifically? Or is he misguided, intentionally? Or is it both? He's an idiot that's also misguided. It's very, it's very hard to grapple with that. And, um, and as much as I'm inclined to blame people or blame the system, as a part of team science, we all have a black eye this week. Because I'm a CRISPR expert, and I didn't prevent that crap from happening. Now, is this my fault, per se? I don't know. Maybe we didn't advocate enough to our users of the ramifications and the ethical implications that their work has. You know, what if one of my students down the road does something stupid like this? Am I at fault? Are they at fault? Is NC State at fault? Are you guys at fault for uh, paying your taxes to NC State to fund that work? It's a, it's a conundrum, um, and there's no, just much like the ethics, there's no easy answer. The pros and the cons, it's, it's a gray area, and the shades of gray is what we have to figure out right now. Yeah. Please. Um, so you talked about how if human gene editing was able to be done, um, and you could cure diseases or disorders such as cystic fibrosis or sickle cell, what is, who is to say whether or not other disorders or diseases to come out of that. So, yeah, so there's about somewhere between eight and 10,000 genetic diseases in the world, right, more, give or take. Some are major, aka like they're killing a lot of people or they're infecting a lot of people. Some are minor, very small diseases that infect a very small population. So access to care is in the big conundrum of CRISPR. Are we compelled to cure everyone or cure the most sick first? Or the biggest disease first? Or the most costly disease first? Like, how, we, how do we decide? So academics can do some of their job, and companies can do their job, too. They're going to go after probably what's easier, easier to do, easier to do, the logos hanging fruit. That's what cystic fibrosis and DMD and thalassemia are on the list. Because those genetic diseases have one mutation. And we know what it is. So think of it as a, a BRCA1 conundrum. Breast cancer. Everybody knows BRCA1, right? BRCA1. So do we have to edit BRCA1, the bad ones, out of embryos to just eradicate that out of humankind? Or do you wait for people to get born and then we try to cure it in their breast tissue only? Or in the end, if they have it, we just do a mastectomy, much cheaper than editing an embryo. What's the course of action? I don't know. We have a standard of care right now, and it works. But is that good enough for quality of life? I don't know. So the bottom line is to ask you a question of those thousands of genetic diseases that are on the list, right? There's probably a dozen or so right now that are being deeply investigated, right? Because there's a path to, we know the disease, we know the gene change that we need to make. We have an idea of how to deliver it. So blood diseases, easy to deliver to, inject into the blood. Muscle diseases like dystrophy, easy to deliver because we just inject it in the muscle. Eye disease is one of those that was on the list because we can just inject in the eye blindness. But you can be blind and still live. So should we waste our time curing diseases where people don't die? I don't know. But the bottom line is anything that's scientifically straightforward, at least academics will work on, and anything that's financially viable short term, all those companies and investors are going to work on. And oftentimes already are. But we're about 6 to 12 disease in, 8,000 ago. It's take a long time. A lot of effort, a lot of science, a lot of investment. But this is where things like a NIH, not listed here, but the National Institutes of Health are investing over $100 million next year in crystal research. 
it's a good start dropping the ocean in my opinion, but I'm not a politician. Just a taxpayer. That's your question? Yeah. So right now we have no animal products that are crispin enhanced. However, right now the breeders have crispy bred the grandparents. So there's like I don't know like elite grandparent lines. I don't know how much you guys know about animal husbanding, but so they've started that process. Probably halfway through that process is about a 46 to 48 month process the third last summer, so we're about 40 months to go, three years ish. Probably halfway through, maybe in a year and a half, we'll have an idea from the FDA and the USDA how this is going to be regulated in the US. So we'll see, and there'll be an actual regulation. Whatever regulation is in place, the manufacturers will likely heed and disclose it's necessary. Um, so, for instance, right now, white button mushroom waxy corn, and most isogenic and cisgenic uses of CRISPR to replicate or recapitulate something that could happen through classical breeding within the species is non-regulated, non-GMO in the U.S. In Europe, if there's anything CRISPR close to it, fully GMO, even if it's doing the same mutation that you would have in natural breeding, which makes no sense, but it's a process, not product type regulation. And most countries uh, haven't decided as of yet today even how to regulate some of those. Starter cultures, non-GMO, because it's a natural mutation process. So your milk will not be labeled GMO, and actually it's not a GMO. But beef, poultry, and pork, probably a year and a half from now we'll know. Maybe early, uh, early 2020, that would be my guess. All right, thank you all for your time and having me here.